Moby Dick by Herman Melville, Chapters 64 to 67. Chapter 64 Stubbs' Supper. Stubbs' whale had been killed some distance from the ship. It was a calm, so, forming a tandem of three boats, we commenced the slow business of towing the trophy to the Pequod. And now, as we eighteen men, with our thirty-six arms and one hundred and eighty thumbs and fingers, slowly toiled hour after hour upon that inert sluggish corpse in the sea, and it seemed hardly to budge at all except at long intervals, good evidence was hereby furnished of the enormousness of the mass we moved. For upon the great canal of Hang Ho, or whatever they call it, in China, four or five laborers on the footpath will draw a bulky freighted junk at the rate of a mile an hour. But this grand argosy we towed heavily forged along, as if laden with pig lead in bulk. Darkness came on, but three lights up and down in the Pequod's main rigging dimly guided our way till drawing nearer we saw Ahab dropping one of several more lanterns over the bulwarks. Vacantly eyeing the heaving whale for a moment, he issued the usual orders for securing it for the night, and then, handing his lantern to a seaman, went his way into the cabin, and did not come forward again until morning. Though in overseeing the pursuit of this whale, Captain Ahab had evinced his customary activity, to call it so, Yet now that the creature was dead, some vague dissatisfaction, or impatience, or despair seemed working in him, as if the sight of that dead body reminded him that Moby Dick was yet to be slain. And, though a thousand other whales were brought to his ship, all that would not one jot advance his grand monomaniac object. Very soon you would have thought from the sound of the Pequod's decks that all hands were preparing to cast anchor in the deep, for heavy chains are being dragged along the deck, and thrust rattling out of the portholes. But by those clanking links the vast corpse itself, not the ship, is to be moored, tied by the head to the stern, and by the tail to the bows. The whale now lies with its black hull close to the vessel's, and seen through the darkness of the night, which obscured the spars and rigging aloft, the two, ship and whale, seemed yoked together, like colossal bullocks, whereof one reclines, while the other remains standing. Footnote. A little item may as well be related here. The strongest and most reliable hold which the ship has upon the whale, when moored alongside, is by the flukes or tail and as from its greater density that part is relatively heavier than any other, excepting the side fins, its flexibility, even in death, causes it to sink low beneath the surface, so that with the hand you cannot get at it from the boat in order to put the chain around it. But this difficulty is ingeniously overcome. A small strong line is prepared, with a wooden float at its outer end, and a weight in its middle, while the other end is secured to the ship. By adroit management the wooden float is made to rise on the other side of the mass, so that now having girdled the whale the chain is readily made to follow suit, and being slipped along the body is at last locked fast round the smallest part of the tail, at the point of junction with its broad flukes or lobes. End of footnote. If Moody Ahab was now all quiescence, at least so far as could be known on deck, Stubb, his second mate, flushed with conquest, betrayed an unusual but still good-natured excitement. Such an unwanted bustle was he in, that the stead Starbuck, his official superior, quietly resigned to him for the time the sole management of affairs. One small helping cause of all this liveliness in Stubb was soon made strangely manifest. Stubb was a high liver. He was somewhat intemperately fond of the whale, as a flavorish thing to his palate. A steak! A steak! Ere I sleep! You, Dagoo, overboard you go, and cut me one from his small! 
Here be it known that though these wild fishermen do not as a general thing, according to the great military maxim, make the enemy defray the current expenses of the war, at least before receiving the proceeds of the voyage, yet now and then you find some of these Nantucketers who have a genuine relish for that particular part of the sperm whale designated by Stubb, comprising the tapering extremity of the body. About midnight that steak was cut and cooked, and lighted by two lanterns of sperm oil, Stubb stoutly stood up to his spermaceti supper at the capstan head, as if that capstan were a sideboard. Nor was Stubb the only banqueter on whale's flesh that night. Mingling their mumblings with his own mastications, thousands on thousands of sharks, swarming round the dead leviathan, smackingly feasted on its fatness. The few sleepers below in their bunks were often startled by the sharp slapping of their tails against the hull, within a few inches of the sleepers' hearts. Peering over the side you could just see them, as before you heard them, wallowing in the sullen, black waters, and turning over on their backs as they scooped out huge, globular pieces of the whale of the bigness of a human head. This particular feat of the shark seems all but miraculous. How, at such an apparently unassailable surface, they contrive to gouge out such symmetrical mouthfuls, remains a part of the universal problem of all things. The mark that they thus leave in the whale may best be likened to a hollow made by a carpenter in countersinking for a screw. Though, amid all the smoking horror and diabolism of a sea-fight, sharks will be seen longingly gazing up to the ship's decks, like hungry dogs round a table where red meat is being carved, ready to bolt down every killed man that is tossed to them, and though, while the valiant butchers over the deck-table are thus cannibally carving each other's live meat with carving knives all gilded and tasseled, the sharks, also, with their jewel-hilted mouths, are quarrelsomely carving away under the table at the dead meat, and though, were you to turn the whole affair upside down, it would still be pretty much the same thing, that is to say, a shocking sharkish business enough for all parties, and though sharks also are the invariable outriders of all slave ships crossing the Atlantic, symmetrically trotting alongside to be handy in case a parcel is to be carried anywhere, or a dead slave to be decently buried, and though one or two other like instances might be set down, touching the set terms, places, and occasions when sharks do most socially congregate, and most hilariously feast, yet there is no conceivable time or occasion when you will find them in such countless numbers, and in gayer or more jovial spirits, than around a dead sperm whale, moored by night to a whale-ship at sea. If you have never seen that sight, then suspend your decision about the propriety of devil-worship, and the expediency of conciliating the devil. But as yet Stubb heeded not the mumblings of the banquet that was going on so nigh him, no more than the sharks heeded the smacking of his own epicurean lips. "'Cook! Cook! Where's that old fleece?' he cried at length, widening his legs still further, as if to form a more secure base for his supper, and at the same time darting his fork into the dish, as if stabbing with his lance. "'Cook! You, cook! Sail this way, cook!' The old black, not in any very high glee at having been previously roused from his warm hammock, at a most unseasonable hour, came shambling along from his galley, for like many old blacks, there was something the matter with his knee-pans, which he did not keep well scoured like his other pans. This old fleece, as they called him, came shuffling and limping along, assisting his step with his tongs, which, after a clumsy fashion, were made of straightened iron hoops. This old ebony floundered along, and in obedience to the word of command, came to a dead stop on the opposite side of Stubb's sideboard, when, with both hands folded before him, and resting on his two-legged cane, he bowed his arched back still further over, at the same time sideways inclining his head, so as to bring his best ear into play. 
Cook, said Stubb, rapidly lifting a rather reddish morsel to his mouth. Don't you think this steak is rather overdone? You've been beating this steak too much, Cook. It's too tender. Don't I always say that to be good a whale steak must be tough? There are those sharks now over the side. Don't you see they prefer it tough and rare? What a shindy they are kicking up. Cook, go and talk to them. Tell them they are welcome to help themselves civilly, and in moderation, but they must keep quiet. Blast me, if I can hear my own voice. Away, Cook, and deliver my message. Here, take this lantern. Snatching one from his sideboard. Now then, go and preach to them. Sullenly taking the offered lantern, old Fleece limped across the deck to the bulwarks, and then, with one hand dropping his light low over the sea, so as to get a good view of his congregation, with the other hand he solemnly flourished his tongs, and leaning far over the side in a mumbling voice, began addressing the sharks, while Stubb, softly crawling behind, overheard all that was said. Fellow critters, I's ordered here to say dat you must stop dat damn noise there. You hear? Stop dat damn smackin' of de lips. Massa Stubb say dat you can fill your damn bellies up to de hatchings, but by gore you must stop dat damn racket. Cook! here interposed Stubb, accompanying the word with a sudden slap on the shoulder. Cook! Why, damn your eyes! You mustn't swear that way when you're preaching. That's no way to convert sinners, Cook. Who dat? Then preach to him yourself, sullenly turning to go. No, Cook. Go on, go on. Well, then, beloved fellow critters. Right, exclaimed Stubb approvingly. Coax em to it. Try that. And Fleece continued. Though you is all sharks, and by nature very voracious, Yet I say to you, fellow critters, dat dat voraciousness, top dat damn slappin' of de tail. How you tink to hear, s'pose you keep up such de damn slappin' and bitin' dare? Cook, cried Stubb, collaring him, I won't have that swearing. Talk to em gentlemanly. Once more the sermon proceeded. Your voraciousness, fellow critters, I don't blame you so much for. That is nature, and can't be helped. But to govern that wicked nature, that is the pint. You is sharks, sartin. But if you govern the shark in you, why then you be angel. For all angel is nothing more than the shark well governed. Now look here, brethren. Just try once to be civil, a helpin' yourselves from dat whale. Don't be tearin' de blubber out of your neighbor's mout, I say. Is not one shark dood right as tudder to dat whale? And by gore, none of you has de right to dat whale. Dat whale belong to someone else. I know some of you has berry brig mouth, brigger than others. But den de big mouth sometimes had de small bellies, so that de brigness of de mouth is not to swallow with, but to bit off de blubber for de small fry of sharks that can't get into the scrounge to help themselves. "'Well done, old fleece,' cried Stubb. "'That's Christianity. Go on.' "'No use going on. The damn willins will keep a scourgin' and a slappin' each other, Massa Stubb. They don't hear one word. No use a preachin' to such damn gluttons as you call em, till their bellies is full, and their bellies is bottomless.' And when they do get em full, they won't hear you then, for then they sink in the sea, go fast to sleep on de coral, and can't hear nothing at all, no more, forever and ever. Upon my soul I am about of the same opinion. So give the benediction, Fleece, and I'll away to my supper. Upon this, Fleece, holding both hands over the fishy mob, raised his shrill voice and cried, Cursed fellow critters! Kick up the damnedest row as ever you can. Fill your damn bellies till they burst, and then die. Now, cook, said Stubb, resuming his supper at the capstan. Stand just where you stood before there, over against me, and pay particular attention. 
All tension, said Fleece, again stooping over his tongs in the desired position. Well, said Stubb, helping himself freely meanwhile, I shall now go back to the subject of this steak. In the first place, how old are you, Cook? What dat to do with the take? said the old black testily. Silence! How old are you, Cook? About ninety, they say, he gloomily muttered. And you have lived in this world hard upon one hundred years, Cook, and don't know yet how to cook a whale steak, rapidly bolting another mouthful at the last word, so that morsel seemed a continuation of the question. Where were you born, Cook? Hind a hatchway, in ferry boat, going over to Roanoke. Born in a ferry boat? That's queer, too. But I want to know what country you were born in, Cook. Didn't I say to Roanoke country? he cried sharply. No, you didn't, Cook. But I'll tell you what I'm coming to, Cook. You must go home and be born over again. You don't know how to cook a whale steak yet. Bress my soul if I cook another one, he growled angrily turning round to depart. Come back here, cook. Here, hand me those tongs. Now take that bit of steak there, and tell me if you think that steak cooked as it should be. Take it, I say, holding the tongs toward him. Take it, and taste it. Faintly smacking his withered lips over it for a moment, the old negro muttered, Best cook take I ever taste. Juicy, very juicy. Cook? said Stubb, squaring himself once more. Do you belong to the church? Passed one once in Cape Town, said the old man sullenly. And you have once in your life passed a holy church in Cape Town, where you doubtless overheard a holy parson addressing his hearers as his beloved fellow creatures, have you, Cook? And yet you come here, and tell me such a dreadful lie as you did just now, eh? said Stubb. Where do you expect to go to, Cook? Go to bed very soon, he mumbled, half turning as he spoke. Avast! Heave to! I mean, when you die, Cook. It's an awful question. Now what's your answer? When this old brack man dies, said the negro slowly, changing his whole air and demeanor, he hisself won't go nowhere, but some bressed angel will come and fetch him. Fetch him? How? In a coach and four, as they fetched Elijah? And fetch him where? Up there, said Fleece, holding his tong straight over his head, and keeping it there very solemnly. So then, you expect to go up into our main top, do you, Cook, when you are dead? But don't you know the higher you climb, the colder it gets? Main top, eh? Didn't say that at all said Fleece, again in the sulks. You said up there, didn't you? And now look yourself and see where your tongs are pointing. But perhaps you expect to get into heaven by crawling through the lubber's hole, Cook. But no, no, Cook, you don't get there except you go the regular way, round by the rigging. It's a ticklish business, but it must be done, or else it's no go. But none of us are in heaven yet. Drop your tongs, Cook, and hear my orders, do you hear? Hold your hat in one hand, and clap the other atop your heart, when I'm giving my orders, Cook. What? That your heart, there? That's your gizzard! Aloft, aloft! That's it, now you have it. Hold it there now, and pay attention. All attention, said the old black, with both hands placed as desired, vainly wriggling his grizzled head as if to get both ears in front, at one and the same time. Well then, Cook, you see this whale steak of yours was so very bad that I have put it out of sight as soon as possible. You see that, don't you? Well, for the future, when you cook another whale steak for my private table here, the capstan, I'll tell you what to do, so as not to spoil it by overdoing. Hold the steak in one hand, and show a live coal to it with the other. That done, dish it, do you hear? And now tomorrow, Cook, when we are cutting in the fish, be sure you stand by to get the tips of his fins, have them put in pickle. As for the ends of the flukes, have them soused, Cook. 
There, now you may go. But Fleece had hardly got three paces off when he was recalled. Cook, give me cutlets for supper tomorrow night in the mid-watch. Do you hear? Away you sail, then. Hello! Stop! Make a bow before you go. Avast! Heaving again! Whale-balls for breakfast! Don't forget! Wish, by gore, whale eat him, stead of him eat whale. I'm breast if he ain't more of shark than Massa shark hisself, muttered the old man, limping away, with which sage ejaculation he went to his hammock. Chapter 65 the whale as a dish. That mortal man should feed upon the creature that feeds his lamp, and, like Stubb, eat him by his own light, as you may say, this seems so outlandish a thing that one must needs go a little into the history and philosophy of it. It is upon record that three centuries ago the tongue of the right whale was esteemed a great delicacy in France, and commanded large prices there. Also, that in Henry the Eighth's time, a certain cook of the court obtained a handsome reward for inventing an admirable sauce to be eaten with barbecued porpoises, which, you remember, are a species of whale. Porpoises, indeed, are to this day considered fine eating. The meat is made into balls about the size of billiard balls, and being well seasoned and spiced, might be taken for turtle balls or veal balls. The old monks of Dunfermline were very fond of them. They had a great porpoise grant from the crown. The fact is that, among his hunters at least, the whale would by all hands be considered a noble dish, were there not so much of him. But when you come to sit down before a meat pie nearly one hundred feet long, it takes away your appetite. Only the most unprejudiced of men, like Stubb, nowadays partake of cooked whales. But the Eskimos are not so fastidious. We all know how they live upon whales, and have rare old vintages of prime old train oil. Zogranda, one of their most famous doctors, recommends strips of blubber for infants as being exceedingly juicy and nourishing. And this reminds me that certain Englishmen, who long ago were accidentally left in Greenland by a whaling vessel, that these men actually lived for several months on the mouldy scraps of whales, which had been left ashore after trying out the blubber. Among the Dutch whalemen these scraps are called fritters, which indeed they greatly resemble, being brown and crisp, and smelling something like old Amsterdam housewives' doughnuts or oily cooks when fresh. They have such an edible look that the most self-denying stranger can hardly keep his hands off. But what further depreciates the whale as a civilized dish is his exceeding richness. He is the great prize ox of the sea, too fat to be delicately good. Look at his hump, which would be as fine eating as the buffalo's, which is esteemed a rare dish, were it not such a solid pyramid of fat. But the spermaceti itself, how bland and creamy that is, like the transparent half-jellied white meat of a coconut in the third month of its growth, yet far too rich to supply a substitute for butter. Nevertheless, many whalemen have a method of absorbing it into some other substance and then partaking of it. In the long try-watches of the night it is a common thing for the seamen to dip their ship biscuit into the huge oil-pots and let them fry there a while. Many a good supper have I thus made. In the case of a small sperm whale, the brains are accounted a fine dish. The casket of the skull is broken into with an axe, and the two plump, whitish lobes being withdrawn, precisely resembling two large puddings, they are then mixed with flour and cooked into a most delectable mess, in flavor somewhat resembling calves' heads, which is quite a dish among some epicures. And every one knows that some young bucks among the epicures, by continually dining upon calves' brains, by and by get to have a little brains of their own, so as to be able to tell a calf's head from their own heads, which indeed requires uncommon discrimination. 
and that is the reason why a young buck with an intelligent-looking calf's head before him is somehow one of the saddest sights you can see. The head looks a sort of reproachfully at him, with an et tu brute expression. It is not perhaps entirely because the whale is so excessively unctuous that landsmen seem to regard the eating of him with abhorrence. That appears to result in some way from the consideration before mentioned, i.e., that a man should eat a newly murdered thing of the sea, and eat it too by its own light, but no doubt the first man that ever murdered an ox was regarded as a murderer. Perhaps he was hung, and if he had been put on his trial by oxen, he certainly would have been, and he certainly deserved it, if any murderer does. Go to the meat market of a Saturday night and see the crowds of live bipeds staring up at the long rows of dead quadrupeds. Does not that sight take a tooth out of the cannibal's jaw? Cannibals? Who is not a cannibal? I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the Fiji that salted down a lean missionary in his cellar against a coming famine, it will be more tolerable for that provident Fiji, I say, in the day of judgment, than for thee, civilized and enlightened gourmand, who nailest geese to the ground and feastest on their bloated livers in thy pâté de foie gras. But Stubb, he eats the whale by its own light, does he? And that is adding insult to injury, is it? Look at your knife-handle there, my civilized and enlightened gourmand, dining off that roast beef. What is that handle made of? What but the bones of the brother of the very ox you are eating? And what do you pick your teeth with after devouring that fat goose? With a feather of the same fowl. And with what quill did the secretary of the Society for the Suppression of Cruelty to Ganders formally indict his circulars? It is only within the last month or two that that society passed a resolution to patronize nothing but steel pens. Chapter 66 The Shark Massacre when, in the southern fishery, a captured sperm whale, after long and weary toil, is brought alongside late at night, it is not, as a general thing at least, customary to proceed at once to the business of cutting him in, for that business is an exceedingly laborious one, is not very soon completed, and requires all hands to set about it. Therefore the common usage is to take in all sail, lash the helm a lee, and then send every one below to his hammock till daylight, with the reservation that until that time anchor watches shall be kept, that is, two and two, for an hour each couple, the crew in rotation shall mount the deck to see that all goes well. But sometimes, especially upon the line in the Pacific, this plan will not answer at all, because such incalculable hosts of sharks gather round the moored carcass that were he left so for six hours, say, on a stretch, little more than the skeleton would be visible by morning. In most other parts of the ocean, however, where these fish do not so largely abound, their wondrous veracity can be at times considerably diminished by vigorously stirring them up with sharp whaling spades, a procedure notwithstanding which, in some instances, only seems to tickle them into still greater activity. But it was not thus in the present case with the Pequod sharks, though to be sure any man unaccustomed to such sights, to have looked over her side that night, would have almost thought the whole round sea was one huge cheese, and those sharks the maggots in it. Nevertheless, upon Stubb setting the anchor watch after his supper was concluded, and when, accordingly, Queequeg and a forecastle seaman came on deck, no small excitement was created among the sharks, for immediately suspending the cutting stages over the side, and lowering three lanterns so that they cast long gleams of light over the turbid seas, these two mariners, darting their long whaling spades, kept up an incessant murdering of the sharks, by striking the keen steel deep into their skulls, seemingly their only vital part. Footnote. The whaling spade used for cutting in is made of the very best steel. 
is about the bigness of a man's spread hand, and in general shape corresponds to the garden implement after which it is named, only its sides are perfectly flat, and its upper end considerably narrower than the lower. This weapon is always kept as sharp as possible, and when being used is occasionally honed, just like a razor. In its socket a stiff pole from twenty to thirty feet long is inserted for a handle. End of footnote. But in the foamy confusion of their mixed and struggling hosts, the marksmen could not always hit their mark, and this brought about new revelations of the incredible ferocity of the foe. They viciously snapped, not only at each other's disembowelments, but, like flexible bows, bent round and bit their own, till those entrails seemed swallowed over and over again by the same mouth, to be oppositely voided by the gaping wound. Nor was this all. It was unsafe to meddle with the corpses and ghosts of these creatures. A sort of generic or pantheistic vitality seemed to lurk in their very joints and bones, after what might be called the individual life had departed. Killed and hoisted on deck for the sake of his skin, one of these sharks almost took poor Queequeg's hand off when he tried to shut down the dead lid of his murderous jaw. Queequeg no care what God made him shark, said the savage, agonizingly lifting his hand up and down, whether Fiji God or Nantucket God, but to God what made shark must be one damn injun. Chapter 67 Cutting In It was a Saturday night, and such a Sabbath as followed. Ex officio professors of Sabbath breaking are all whalemen. The ivory Pequod was turned into what seemed a shamble, every sailor a butcher. You would have thought we were offering up ten thousand red oxen to the sea gods. In the first place, the enormous cutting tackles, among other ponderous things comprising a cluster of blocks generally painted green, and which no single man can possibly lift, this vast bunch of grapes was swayed up to the main top, and firmly lashed to the lower masthead, the strongest point anywhere above a ship's deck. The end of the hawser-like rope winding through these intricacies was then conducted to the windlass, and the huge lower block of the tackles was swung over the whale. To this block the great blubber-hook, weighing some one hundred pounds, was attached, and now, suspended in stages over the side, Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, armed with their long spades, began cutting a hole in the body for the insertion of the hook, just above the nearest of the two side fins. This done, a broad semicircular line is cut round the hole, the hook is inserted, and the main body of the crew, striking up a wild chorus, now commence heaving in one dense crowd at the windlass when instantly the entire ship careens over on her side, every bolt in her starts like the nail-heads of an old house in frosty weather. She trembles, quivers, and nods her frighted mastheads to the sky. More and more she leans over to the whale, while every gasping heave of the windlass is answered by a helping heave from the billows, till at last a swift startling snap is heard, with a great swash the ship rolls upward and backwards from the whale, and the triumphant tackle rises into sight, dragging after it the disengaged semicircular end of the first strip of blubber. Now, as the blubber envelops the whale precisely as the rind does an orange, so it is stripped off from the body precisely as an orange is sometimes stripped by spiralizing it. For the strain constantly kept up by the windlass continually keeps the whale rolling over and over in the water, and as the blubber in one strip uniformly peels off along the line called the scarf, simultaneously cut by the spades of Starbuck and Stubb, the mates, and just as fast as it is thus peeled off, and indeed by that very act itself, it is all the time being hoisted higher and higher aloft, till its upper end grazes the main top. The men at the windlass then cease heaving, and for a moment or two the prodigious blood-dripping mass sways to and fro as if let down from the sky, 
and every one present must take good heed to dodge it when it swings, else it may box his ears and pitch him headlong overboard. One of the attending harpooners now advances with a long keen weapon called a boarding sword, and, watching his chance, he dexterously slices out a considerable hole in the lower part of the swaying mass. Into this hole, the end of the second alternating great tackle is then hooked, so as to retain a hold upon the blubber, in order to prepare for what follows. Whereupon this accomplished swordsman, warning all hands to stand off, once more makes a scientific dash at the mass, and with a few sidelong desperate lunging slicings, severs it completely in twain, so that while the short lower part is still fast, the long upper strip, called a blanket piece, swings clear, and is all ready for lowering. The heavers forward now resume their song, and while the one tackle is peeling and hoisting a second strip from the whale, the other is slowly slackened away, and down goes the first strip through the main hatchway right beneath, into an unfurnished parlour called the blubber room. Into this twilight apartment, sundry nimble hands keep coiling away the long blanket piece as if it were a great live mass of pleated serpents. And thus the work proceeds, the two tackles hoisting and lowering simultaneously, both whale and windlass heaving, the heavers singing, the blubber room gentlemen coiling, the mates scarfing, the ships straining, and all hands swearing occasionally, by way of assuaging the general friction. End of chapter 64 to 67 Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapter 68 to 71 Chapter 68 the blanket. I have given no small attention to that not unvexed subject, the skin of the whale. I have had controversies about it with experienced whalemen afloat, and learned naturalists ashore. My original opinion remains unchanged, but it is only an opinion. The question is, what and where is the skin of the whale? Already you know what his blubber is. That blubber is something of the consistence of firm, close-grained beef, but tougher, more elastic and compact, and ranges from eight or ten to twelve and fifteen inches in thickness. Now, however preposterous it may at first seem to talk of any creature's skin as being of that sort of consistence and thickness, yet in point of fact these are no arguments against such a presumption because you cannot raise any other dense enveloping layer from the whale's body but that same blubber, and the outermost enveloping layer of any animal, if reasonably dense, what can that be but the skin? True, from the unmarred dead body of the whale, you may scrape off with your hand an infinitely thin, transparent substance, somewhat resembling the thinnest shreds of isinglass, only it is almost as flexible and soft as satin, that is, previous to being dried, when it not only contracts and thickens, but becomes rather hard and brittle. I have several such dried bits, which I use for marks in my whale books. It is transparent, as I said before, and being laid upon the printed page, I have sometimes pleased myself with fancying it exerted a magnifying influence, at any rate, it is pleasant to read about whales through their own spectacles, as you may say. But what I am driving at here is this. The same infinitely thin isinglass substance, which, I admit, invests the entire body of the whale, is not so much to be regarded as the skin of the creature, as the skin of the skin, so to speak. For it were simply ridiculous to say that the proper skin of the tremendous whale is thinner and more tender than the skin of a newborn child. But no more of this. Assuming the blubber to be the skin of the whale, then when this skin, as in the case of a very large sperm whale, will yield the bulk of one hundred barrels of oil, and when it is considered that, in quantity, or rather weight, that oil, in its express state, is only three-fourths, and not the entire substance of the coat, 
some idea may hence be had of the enormousness of that animated mass, a mere part of whose mere integument yields such a lake of liquid as that. Reckoning ten barrels to the ton, you have ten tons for the net weight of only three-quarters of the stuff of the whale's skin. In life, the visible surface of the sperm whale is not the least among the many marvels he presents. Almost invariably, it is all over obliquely crossed and recrossed with numberless straight marks in thick array, something like those in the finest Italian line engravings. But these marks do not seem to be impressed upon the isinglass substance above mentioned, but seem to be seen through it, as if they were engraved upon the body itself. Nor is this all. In some instances, to the quick, observant eye, those linear marks, as in a veritable engraving, but afford the ground for far other delineations. These are hieroglyphical, that is, if you call those mysterious ciphers on the walls of the pyramids hieroglyphics, then that is the proper word to use in the present connection. By my retentive memory of the hieroglyphics upon one sperm whale in particular, I was much struck with a plate representing the old Indian characters chiseled on the famous hieroglyphic palisades on the banks of the upper Mississippi. Like those mystic rocks, too, the mystic-marked whale remains undecipherable. This allusion to the Indian rocks reminds me of another thing. Besides all the other phenomena which the exterior of the sperm whale presents, he not seldom displays the back, and more especially his flanks, effaced in great part of the regular linear appearance by reason of numerous rude scratches, altogether of an irregular, random aspect. I should say that those New England rocks on the sea coast, which Agassi imagines to bear the marks of violent scraping contact with vast floating icebergs, I should say that those rocks must not a little resemble the sperm whale in this particular. It also seems to me that such scratches in the whale are probably made by hostile contact with other whales, for I have most remarked them in the large, full-grown bulls of the species. A word or two more concerning this matter of the skin or blubber of the whale. It has already been said that it is stripped from him in long pieces, called blanket pieces. Like most sea terms, this one is very happy and significant, for the whale is indeed wrapped up in his blubber as in a real blanket or counterpane, or, still better, an Indian poncho slipped over his head and skirting his extremity. It is by reason of this cosy blanketing of his body that the whale is enabled to keep himself comfortable in all weathers, in all seas, times, and tides. What would become of a Greenland whale, say, in those shuddering icy seas of the north, if unsupplied with his cosy surtout? True, other fish are found exceedingly brisk in those hyperborean waters, but these, be it observed, are your cold-blooded, lungless fish, whose very bellies are refrigerators, creatures that warm themselves under the lee of an iceberg, as a traveller in winter would bask before an inn-fire, whereas, like man, the whale has lungs and warm blood, frees his blood, and he dies. How wonderful it is, then, except after explanation, that this great monster, to whom corporeal warmth is as indispensable as it is to man, how wonderful that he should be found at home, immersed to his lips for life in those arctic waters, where, when seamen fall overboard, they are sometimes found months afterward, perpendicularly frozen into the hearts of fields of ice, as a fly is found glued in amber. But more surprising it is to know, as has been proved by experiment, that the blood of a polar whale is warmer than that of a Borneo negro in summer. It does seem to me that herein we see the rare virtue of a strong individual vitality, and the rare virtue of thick walls, and the rare virtue of interior spaciousness. Oh, man, admire and model thyself after the whale. Do thou, too, remain warm among ice. Do thou, too, live in this world without being of it. Be cool at the equator. 
keep thy blood fluid at the pole, like the great dome of St. Peter's, and like the great whale, retain, O man, in all seasons, a temperature of thine own. But how easy, and how hopeless, to teach these fine things! Of erections how few are domed like St. Peter's, of creatures how few vast as the whale! Chapter 69 The Funeral Haul in the chains, let the carcass go astern. The vast tackles have now done their duty. The peeled white body of the beheaded whale flashes like a marble sepulchre. Though changed in hue, it has not perceptibly lost anything in bulk. It is still colossal. Slowly it floats more and more away, the water round it torn and splashed by the insatiate sharks, and the air above vexed with rapacious flights of screaming fowls, whose beaks are like so many insulting poniards in the whale. The vast, white, headless phantom floats further and further from the ship, and every rod that it so floats, what seems square roods of sharks and cubic roods of fowls augment the murderous din. For hours and hours from the almost stationary ship that hideous sight is seen, beneath the unclouded and mild azure sky, upon the fair face of the pleasant sea, wafted by the joyous breezes, that great mass of death floats on and on, till lost in infinite perspectives. There's a most doleful and most mocking funeral, the sea vultures all in pious mourning, the air sharks all punctiliously in black or speckled, in life but few of them would have helped the whale, I ween, if peradventure he had needed it. But upon the banquet of his funeral they most piously do pounce. O oh, horrible vulturism of earth, from which not the mightiest whale is free! Nor is this the end. Desecrated as the body is, a vengeful ghost survives and hovers over it to scare espied by some timid man-of-war or blundering discovery vessel from afar, when the distance obscuring the swarming fowls nevertheless still shows the white mass floating in the sun, and the white spray heaving high against it, straightway the whale's unharming corpse with trembling fingers is set down in the log. Shoals, rocks, and breakers hereabouts, beware! And for years afterwards, perhaps, ships shun the place leaping over it as silly sheep leap over a vacuum because their leader originally leaped there when a stick was held there's your law of precedence there's your utility of traditions there's the story of your obstinate survival of old beliefs never bottomed on the earth and not now even hovering in the air there's orthodoxy Thus, while in life the great whale's body may have been a real terror to his foes, in his death his ghost becomes a powerless panic to the world. Are you a believer in ghosts, my friend? There are other ghosts than the Cock Lane one, and far deeper men than Dr. Johnson, who believe in them. Chapter 70 The Sphinx it should not have been omitted that previous to completely stripping the body of the leviathan, he was beheaded. Now, the beheading of the sperm whale is a scientific anatomical feat, upon which experienced whale surgeons very much pride themselves, and not without reason. Consider that the whale has nothing that can properly be called a neck. On the contrary, where his head and body seem to join, there, in that very place, is the thickest part of him. Remember also that the surgeon must operate from above, some eight or ten feet intervening between him and his subject, and that subject almost hidden in a discoloured, rolling, and oftentimes tumultuous and bursting sea. Bear in mind, too, that under these untoward circumstances, he has to cut many feet deep in the flesh and in that subterraneous matter, without so much as getting one single peep into the ever-contracting gash thus made, he must skilfully steer clear of all adjacent interdicted parts, and exactly divide the spine at a critical point, 
hard by its insertion into the skull. Do you not marvel, then, at Stubb's boast that he demanded but ten minutes to behead a sperm whale? When first severed, the head is dropped astern, and held there by a cable till the body is stripped. That done, if it belong to a small whale, it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of. But with a full-grown leviathan this is impossible, for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk, and completely to suspend such a burden as that, even by the immense tackles of a whaler, this were as vain a thing as to attempt weighing a Dutch barn in jeweler's scales. The Pequod's whale being decapitated and the body stripped, the head was hoisted against the ship's side, about halfway out of the sea, so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by its native element. And there, with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it, by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower masthead, and every yard-arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves, there that blood-dripping head hung to the Pequod's waist, like the giant Holofernes from the girdle of Judith. When this last task was accomplished it was noon, and the seamen went below to their dinner. Silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck. An intense copper calm, like a universal yellow lotus, was more and more unfolding its noiseless, measureless leaves upon the sea. A short space elapsed, and up into this noiselessness came Ahab, alone from his cabin. Taking a few turns on the quarter-deck, he paused to gaze over the side. Then, slowly getting into the main chains, he took Stubb's long spade, still remaining there after the whale's decapitation, and, striking it into the lower part of the half-suspended mass, placed its other end crutch-wise under one arm, and so stood leaning over with eyes attentively fixed on this head. It was a black and hooded head, and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm, it seemed the sphinxes in the desert. "'Speak, thou vast and venerable head!' muttered Ahab, which, though ungarnished with a beard, yet here and there looks hoary with mosses. Speak, mighty head, and tell us the secret thing that is in thee. Of all divers thou hast dived the deepest. That head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations, where unrecorded names and navies rust, and untold hopes and anchors rot, where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned, there in that awful waterland, there was thy most familiar home. Thou hast been where bell or diver never went, hast slept by many a sailor's side, where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down. Thou sawest the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship, heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave, true to each other when heaven seemed false to them. Thou sawest the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck, for hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw, and his murderers still sailed on unharmed while swift lightnings shivered the neighboring ship that would have borne a righteous husband to outstretched longing arms. O oh, head, thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of Abraham, and not one syllable is thine. Sail ho! cried a triumphant voice from the main masthead. Aye, well now, that's cheering cried Ahab, suddenly erecting himself, while whole thunder-clouds swept aside from his brow. That lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man. Where away? Three points on the starboard bow, sir, and bringing down her breeze to us. Better and better, man. Would now St. Paul would come along that way, and to my breezelessness bring his breeze. O oh, nature, and O oh, soul of man, how far beyond all utterances are your linked analogies! 
not the smallest atom stirs or lives on matter, but has its cunning duplicate in mind. Chapter 71 The Jeroboam Story Hand in hand, ship and breeze blew on, but the breeze came faster than the ship, and soon the Pequod began to rock. By and by, through the glass, the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale-ship, but as she was so far to windward and shooting by, apparently making a passage to some other ground, the Pequod could not hope to reach her, so the signal was set to see what response would be made. Here be it said that, like the vessels of military marines, the ships of the American whale-fleet have each a private signal, all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels attached, and every captain provided with it. Thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean, even at considerable distances and with no small facility. The Pequod's signal was at last responded to by the strangers setting her own, which proved the ship to be the Jeroboam of Nantucket. Squaring her yards, she bore down, ranged a beam under the Pequod's lee, and lowered a boat. It soon drew nigh, but as the side-ladder was being rigged by Starbuck's order to accommodate the visiting captain, the stranger in question waved his hand from the boat's stern, in token of that proceeding being entirely unnecessary. It turned out that the Jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board, and that Mayhew, her captain, was fearful of infecting the Pequod's company. For though himself and boat's crew remained untainted, and though his ship was half a rifle shot off, and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between, yet conscientiously adhering to the timid quarantine of the land, he peremptorily refused to come into direct contact with the Pequod. But this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pequod, as she heavily forged through the sea, for by this time it blew very fresh, with her main topsail aback. Though, indeed, at times, by the sudden onset of a large rolling wave, the boat would be pushed some way ahead, but would be soon skilfully brought to her proper bearings again. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of singular appearance, even in that wild whaling life where individual notabilities make up all totalities, he was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, that's he! That's he! The long-togged scaramouche the town hose company told us of. Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the Jeroboam, and a certain man among her crew, some time previous when the Pequod spoke the town ho. According to this account, and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouche in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had originally been nurtured among the crazy society of Neskuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet, in their cracked secret meetings having several times descended from heaven by way of a trap-door, announcing the speedy opening of the seventh vial which he carried in his vest pocket, but which, instead of containing gunpowder, was supposed to be charged with laudanum. A strange apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Neskuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady common-sense exterior, and offered himself as a green-hand candidate for the Jeroboam's whaling voyage. 
They engaged him, but straight away upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the archangel Gabriel, and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the isles of the sea, and vicar-general of all Oceanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things, the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium, united to invest this Gabriel in the minds of the majority of the ignorant crew with an atmosphere of sacredness. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased, the incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him, but apprised that that individual's intention was to land him in the first convenient port, the archangel forthwith opened all his seals and vials, devoting the ship and all hands to unconditional perdition, in case this intention was carried out. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him, if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan. Nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would, so that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates, and since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the plague, as he called it, was at his sole command, nor should it be stayed but according to his good pleasure. The sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, and some of them fawned before him, in obedience to his instructions sometimes rendering him personal homage as to a god. Such things may seem incredible, but however wondrous they are true nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself as his measureless power of deceiving and bedeviling so many others. But it is time to return to the Pequod. "'I fear not thy epidemic, man,' said Ahab from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat's stern. "'Come on board!' But now Gabriel started to his feet. "'Think!' Think of the fevers, yellow and bilious! Beware of the horrible plague! Gabriel, Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew, thou must either... But that instant a headlong wave shot the boat far ahead, and its seethings drowned all speech. Hast thou seen the white whale? demanded Ahab when the boat drifted back. Think, think of thy whale-boat, stoven and sunk, Beware of the horrible tale! I tell thee again, Gabriel, that... But again the boat tore ahead as if dragged by fiends. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which by one of those occasional caprices of the seas were tumbling, not heaving it. Meantime the hoisted sperm-whale's head jogged about very violently, and Gabriel was seen eyeing it, with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain Mayhew began a dark story concerning Moby Dick, not, however, without frequent interruptions from Gabriel, whenever his name was mentioned, and the crazy sea that seemed leagued with him. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home, when, upon speaking a whale-ship, her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick, and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in this intelligence, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale, in case the monster should be seen, in his gibbering insanity, pronouncing the white whale to be no less a being than the Shaker God incarnated, the Shakers receiving the Bible. But when some year or two afterward Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him, and the captain himself being not unwilling to let him have the opportunity, despite all the archangel's denunciations and forewarnings, 
Macy succeeded in persuading five men to man his boat. With them he pushed off, and, after much weary pulling, and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures, and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious assailants of his divinity. Now, while Macy, the mate, was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying to get a fair chance for his poised lance, lo a broad white shadow rose from the sea by its quick fanning motion temporarily taking the breath out of the bodies of the oarsmen next instant the luckless mate so full of furious life was smitten bodily into the air and making a long arc in his descent fell into the sea at a distance of about fifty yards not a chip of the boat was harmed nor a hair of any oarsman's head but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that, of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery, this kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener the boat's bow is knocked off, or the thigh-board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies the body. But strangest of all is the circumstance, that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity, with the falling form of Macy, was plainly descried from the ship. Raising a piercing shriek, The vile! The vile! Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy, which any one might have done, and so have chanced to hit one of many marks in the wide margin allowed. He became a nameless terror to the ship. Mayhew, having concluded his narration, Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale, if opportunity should offer. To which Ahab answered, Ay. Straightway then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed with downward-pointed finger, Think! Think of the blasphemer! Dead and down there! Beware of the blasphemer's end! Ahab stolidly turned aside, then said to Mayhew, Captain, I have just bethought me of my letter-bag. There is a letter for one of thy officers, if I mistake it not. Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale-ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed depends upon the mere chance of encountering them in the four oceans. Thus most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull, spotted green mould, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter Death himself might well have been the postboy. "'Canst not read it?' cried Ahab. "'Give it me, man. Ay, ay, it's but a dim scrawl. What's this?' As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting-spade pole, and with his knife slightly split the end to insert the letter there, and in that way hand it to the boat, without its coming any closer to the ship. Meantime, Ahab, holding the letter, muttered, Mr. Harry, Harry is, yes, Mr. Harry, a woman's penny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager. Aye, Mr. Harry Macy, ship Jeroboam. Why, it's Macy, and he's dead. Poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself cried Gabriel to Ahab. Thou art soon going that way. Curses throttle thee, yelled Ahab. Captain Mayhew, 
Stand by now to receive it. And taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that, as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along with Gabriel's eager hand. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat knife, and, impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As, after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. End of chapters 68 to 71 Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 72 and 73 Chapter 72 The Monkey Rope in the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend Queequeg, whose duty it was, as harpooner, to descend upon the monster's back for the special purpose referred to. But in very many cases, Circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole tensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So, down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume, a shirt and socks, in which, to my eyes at least, he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a better chance to observe him, as will presently be seen. Being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the dead whale's back. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea, by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope, attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round his waist. It was a humorously perilous business for both of us. For before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather one. So that, for better or for worse, we two, for the time, were wedded, and should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more, then both usage and honor demanded that instead of cutting the cord, it should drag me down in his wake. So then, an elongated Siamese ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in a joint-stock company of two, that my free will had received a mortal wound, and that another's mistake or misfortune might plunge innocent me into unmerited disaster and death. Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in providence, for its even-handed equity never could have so gross an injustice. 
And yet, still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and the ship, which would threaten to jam him, still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mind was the precise situation of every mortal that breathes. Only in most cases, he, one way or other, has this Siamese connection with a plurality of other mortals. If your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that by exceeding caution, you may possibly escape these and multitudinous other evil chances of life. But handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would, sometimes he jerked it so, that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I had only the management of one end of it. Footnote. The monkey rope is found in all whalers, but it was only in the Pequod that the monkey and his holder were ever tied together. This improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford the imperiled harpooner the strongest possible guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his monkey rope holder. End of footnote. I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship, where he would occasionally fall from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming jeopardy he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks, now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed round it like bees in a beehive, and right in among those sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet, a thing altogether incredible, were it not that, attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneous carnivorous sharks will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that, since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them, Accordingly, besides the monkey rope with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still another protection. Suspended over the side in one of the stages, Tashtego and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half-hidden by the blood-muddled water, those indiscreet spades of theirs would come nearer amputating a leg than a tail. But poor Queequeg, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook, Poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his gods. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, thought I, as I drew in and then slacked off the rope to every swell of the sea, what matters it, after all? Are you not the precious image of each and all of us men in this wailing world? That unsounded ocean you gasp in is life, those sharks your foes, those spades your friends, and what between sharks and spades, you are in a sad pickle and peril, poor lad. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes, the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains, and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side, the steward advances, and with a benevolent, consolatory glance, hands him, what, some hot cognac? No. Hands him, ye God, hands him a cup of tepid ginger and water. Ginger? Do I smell ginger? Suspiciously asked Stubb, coming near. Yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untasted cup. Then, standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked toward the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger! Ginger! And will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of ginger? Ginger! Is ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal? Ginger! 
"'What the devil is ginger? "'Sea coal? "'Firewood? "'Lucifer matches? "'Tinder? "'Gunpowder? "'What the devil is ginger, I say, "'that you offer this cup to our poor Queequeg here?' "'There is some sneaking temperance society movement about this business,' he suddenly added, now approaching Starbuck, who had just come from forward. "'Will you look at that canakin, sir? Smell of it, if you please.' Then, watching the mate's countenance, he added, "'The steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calamal and jollop to Queequeg there, this instant off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir?' And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said Starbuck. It is poor stuff enough. Aye, aye, steward, cried Stubb. We'll teach you to drug it, Harpenier. None of your apothecary's medicine here. You want to poison us, do you? You have got out insurance on our lives, and want to murder us all and pocket the proceeds, do you? "'It was not me,' cried Doughboy. "'It was Aunt Charity that brought the ginger on board, "'and bade me never give the harpooners any spirits, "'but only this ginger-jub, so she called it. "'Ginger-jub! You gingery rascal! "'Take that, and run along with you to the lockers, "'and get something better. "'I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. "'It is the captain's orders. "'Grog for the harpooner on a whale.' "'Enough,' replied Starbuck. Only don't hit him again, but, oh, I never hurt when I hit, except when I hit a whale or something of that sort. And this fellow's a weasel. Uh, what were you about saying, sir? Only this. Go down with him and get what thou wantest thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand and a sort of tea caddy in the other. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg, the second was Aunt Charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. Chapter 73 Stub and Flask Kill a Right Whale, and Then Have a Talk Over Him It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the Pequod's side, but we must let it continue hanging there for a while, till we can get a chance to attend to it. For the present other matters press, and the best we can do now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now, during the past night and forenoon, the Pequod had gradually drifted into a sea, which, by its occasional patches of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, a species of the leviathan, that but few supposed to be at this particular time lurking anywhere near. And though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the Pequod was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the Crozettes without lowering a boat, yet now that a sperm whale had been brought alongside and beheaded, to the surprise of all, the announcement was made that a right whale should be captured that day if opportunity offered. Nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly in the distance they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after news came from aloft that one or both the boats must be fast. An interval passed, and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull, that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly disappeared from view, as if diving under the keel. Cut! Cut! was the cry from the ship to the boats, which for one instant seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side but having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the tightened line in one direction, and still plied their oars in another, 
the contending strain threatened to take them under. But it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain, and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, as the strained line scraping beneath the ship suddenly rose to view under her bows, snapping and quivering, and so flinging off its drippings that the drops fell like bits of broken glass on the water, while the whale beyond also rose to sight, and once more the boats were free to fly. But the fagged whale abated his speed, and, blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship, towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meanwhile they hauled more and more upon their lines, till, close flanking him on both sides, Stubb answered Flask with lance for lance, and thus round and round the Pequod the battle went, while the multitudes of sharks that had before swum round the sperm whale's body rushed to the fresh blood that was spilled, thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did, at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. "'I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard,' said Stubb, not without some disgust at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. "'Wants with it,' said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. "'Did you never hear that the ship, which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her starboard side, and at the same time a right whale's head on the larboard, did you never hear, Stubb, that that ship can never afterwards capsize? Why not? I don't know, but I heard that gamboge ghost of a Fadala saying so, and he seems to know all about ship's charms, but I sometimes think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stubb. Did you ever notice how that tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake's head, Stubb? sink him. I never look at him at all, but if ever I get a chance of a dark night, and he's standing hard by the bulwarks, and no one by, look down there, Flask, pointing into the sea with a peculiar motion of both hands. Aye, will I? Flask, I take that Fadala to be the devil in disguise. Do you believe that cock-and-bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say, the reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him! Now that I think of it, he's always wanting oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. He sleeps in his boots, don't he? He hasn't got any hammock, but I've seen him lay of nights in a coil of rigging. No doubt. And it's because of his cursed tail. He coils it down, do you see, in the eye of the rigging. What's the old man have so much to do with him for? Striking up a swap or a bargain, I suppose. Bargain? About what? Why, do you see, the old man is hard bent after that white whale, and the devil there is trying to come round him and get him to swap away his silver watch, or his soul, or something of that sort, and then he'll surrender Moby Dick. Pooh, <laughs> Stubb, you are skylarking. How can Fadala do that? I don't know, Flask, but the devil is a curious chap, and a wicked one, I tell you. Why, they say is how he went a-sauntering into the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home, and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil, switching his hoofs, up and says, I want John. What for? says the old governor. What business is that of yours? says the devil, getting mad. I want to use him. Take him, says the governor. And by the Lord, Flask, if the devil didn't give John the Asiatic cholera before he got through with him, I'll eat this whale in one mouthful. But look sharp. Ain't you already there? Well, then pull ahead, and let's get the whale alongside. I think I remember some such story as you were telling, said Flask, when at last the two boats were slowly advancing with their burden towards the ship. But I can't remember where. Three Spaniards? Adventures of those three bloody-minded soldados? 
Did you read it there, Flask? I guess you did. No, never saw such a book. Heard of it, though. But now tell me, Stubb, do you suppose that that devil you were speaking of just now was the same you say is now on board the Pequod? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Doesn't the devil live forever? Who ever heard that the devil was dead? Did you ever see any parson wearing a mourning for the devil? And if the devil has a latch-key to get into the admiral's cabin, don't you suppose he can crawl into a porthole? Tell me that, Mr. Flask. How old do you suppose Fadala is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there? Pointing to the ship. Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops in the Pequod's hold, and string along in a row with that mast for aughts. Do you see? Well, that wouldn't begin to be Fadala's age. Nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make aughts enough. But see here, Stubb, I thought you a little boasted just now that you meant to give Fadala a sea toss if you got a good chance. Now, if he's so old as all those hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live forever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. Give him a good ducking, anyhow. But he'd crawl back. Duck him again, and keep ducking him. Suppose he should take it into his head to duck you, though. Yes, and drown you. What then? I should like to see him try it. I'd give him such a pair of black eyes that he wouldn't dare show his face in the admiral's cabin again for a long while, let alone down in the orlop there where he lives, and hereabouts on the upper decks where he sneaks so much. Damn the devil, Flask! So you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him? Except the old governor who dares and catch him and put him in double darbies as he deserves, but lets him go about kidnapping people. Ay, and signed a bond with him that all the people the devil kidnapped he'd roast for him. There's a governor. Do you suppose Fadala wants to kidnap Captain Ahab? Do I suppose it? You'll know it before long, Flask. But I am going now to keep a sharp lookout on him. And if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of the neck and say, Look here, Beelzebub, you don't do it. And if he makes any fuss, by the Lord, I'll make a grab into his pocket for his tail take it to the capstan and give him such a wrenching and heaving that his tail will come short off at the stump do you see and then i rather guess when he finds himself docked in that queer fashion he'll sneak off without the poor satisfaction of feeling his tail between his legs and what will you do with the tail stub do with it sell it for an ox whip when we get home what else now do you mean what you say and have been saying all along stub Mean or not mean, here we are at the ship. The boats were here hailed to tow the whale on the larboard side, where fluke chains and other necessaries were already prepared for securing him. Didn't I tell you so? said Flask. Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that parmacetes. In good time, Flask's saying proved true. As before, the Pequod steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head. Now, by the counterpoise of both heads, she regained her even keel. Though sorely strained, you may well believe. So, when on one side you hoist in Locke's head, you go over that way, but now on the other side hoist in Kant's, and you come back again, but in very poor plight. Thus some minds forever keep trimming boat. Oh, you foolish! Throw all these thunderheads overboard, and then you will float light and right. In disposing of the body of a right whale, when brought alongside the ship, the same preliminary proceedings commonly take place as in the case of a sperm whale. Only in the latter instance the head is cut off whole, but in the former the lips and tongue are separately removed and hoisted on deck, with all the well-known black bone attached to what is called the crown piece. But nothing like this in the present case had been done. The carcasses of both whales had dropped astern, and the head-laden ship not a little resembled a mule carrying a pair of overburdening panniers. Meantime, Fadala was calmly eyeing the right whale's head, and ever and anon glancing from the deep wrinkles there to the lines in his own hand. And Ahab chanced so to stand that the Parsi occupied his shadow, while if the Parsi's shadow was there at all, it seemed only to blend with and lengthen Ahab's. 
As the crew toiled on, Laplandish speculations were bandied among them concerning all these passing things. End of chapters 72 and 73 Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 74 to 77 Chapter 74 The Sperm Whale's Head Contrasted View here now are two great whales laying their heads together. Let us join them, and lay together our own. Of the grand order of folio leviathans, the sperm whale and the right whale are by far the most noteworthy. They are the only whales regularly hunted by man. To the Nantucketer they present the two extremes of all the known varieties of the whale. As the external difference between them is mainly observable in their heads, and as a head of each is this moment hanging from the Pequod's side, and as we may freely go from one to the other by merely stepping across the deck, where, I should like to know, will you obtain a better chance to study practical cetology than here? In the first place, you are struck by the general contrast between these heads. Both are massive enough in all conscience, but there is a certain mathematical symmetry in the sperm whales which the right whales sadly lacks. There is more character in the sperm whale's head. As you behold it, you involuntarily yield the immense superiority to him in point of pervading dignity. In the present instance, too, this dignity is heightened by the pepper and salt color of his head at the summit giving token of advanced age and large experience. In short, he is what the fishermen technically call a gray-headed whale. Let us now note what is least dissimilar in these heads, namely the two most important organs, the eye and the ear. Far back on the side of the head, and low down near the angle of either whale's jaw, if you narrowly search, you will at last see a lashless eye, which you would fancy to be a young colt's eye, so out of all proportion is it to the magnitude of the head. Now from this peculiar sideway position of the whale's eyes, it is plain that he can never see an object which is exactly a head, no more than he can one exactly astern. In a word, the position of the whale's eyes corresponds to that of a man's ears, and you may fancy for yourself how it would fare with you did you sideways survey objects through your ears. You would find that you could only command some thirty degrees of vision in advance of the straight sideline of sight, and about thirty more behind it. If your bitterest foe were walking straight towards you, with dagger uplifted in broad day, you would not be able to see him, any more than if he were stealing upon you from behind. In a word, you would have two backs, so to speak, but at the same time also two fronts, side fronts. For what is it that makes the front of a man, what indeed, but his eyes? Moreover, while in most other animals that I can now think of, the eyes are so planted as imperceptibly to blend their visual power, so as to produce one picture and not two to the brain, the peculiar position of the whale's eyes, effectually divided as they are by many cubic feet of solid head, which towers between them like a great mountain separating two lakes in valleys, this of course must wholly separate the impressions which each independent organ imparts. The whale, therefore, must see one distinct picture on this side, and another distinct picture on that side while all between must be profound darkness and nothingness to him. Man may, in effect, be said to look out on the world from a sentry-box with two joined sashes for his window, but for the whale, these two sashes are separately inserted, making two distinct windows, but sadly impairing the view. This peculiarity of the whale's eyes is a thing always to be borne in mind in the fishery, and to be remembered by the reader in some subsequent scenes. A curious and most puzzling question might be started concerning this visual matter as touching the Leviathan, but I must be content with a hint. 
So long as a man's eyes are open in the light, the act of seeing is involuntary, that is, he cannot help mechanically seeing whatever objects are before him. Nevertheless, any one's experience will teach him that though he can take in an undiscriminating sweep of things at one glance, it is quite impossible for him, attentively and completely, to examine any two things, however large or however small, at one and the same instant of time, never mind if they lie side by side and touch each other. But if you now come to separate these two objects, and surround each by a circle of profound darkness, then in order to see one of them, in such a manner as to bring your mind to bear on it, the other will be utterly excluded from your contemporary consciousness. How is it then with the whale? True, both his eyes in themselves must simultaneously act, but is his brain so much more comprehensive, combining, and subtle than man's, that he can, at the same moment of time, attentively examine two distinct prospects, one on one side of him, and the other in an exactly opposite direction? If he can, then is it a marvelous thing in him, as if a man were able to simultaneously go through the demonstrations of two distinct problems in Euclid, nor, strictly investigated, is there any incongruity in this comparison. It may be but an idle whim, but it has always seemed to me that the extraordinary vacillations of movement displayed by some whales when beset by three or four boats, the timidity and liability to queer frights so common to such whales, I think that all this indirectly proceeds from the helpless perplexity of volition in which their divided and diametrically opposite powers of vision must involve them. But the ear of the whale is full as curious as the eye. If you are an entire stranger to their race, you might hunt over these two heads for hours and never discover that organ. The ear has no external leaf whatever, and into the hole itself you can hardly insert a quill, so wondrously minute is it. It is lodged a little behind the eye. With respect to their ears, this important difference is to be observed between the sperm whale and the right, while the ear of the former has an external opening, that of the latter is entirely and evenly covered over with a membrane, so as to be quite imperceptible from without. Is it not curious that so vast a being as the whale should see the world through so small an eye, and hear the thunder through an ear which is smaller than a hare's? But if the eye were broad as the lens of Herschel's great telescope, and his ears capacious as the porches of cathedrals, would that make him any longer of sight or sharper of hearing? Not at all. Why, then, do you try to enlarge your mind? Subtilize it. Let us now, with whatever levers and steam engines we have at hand, cant over the sperm whale's head, that it may lie bottom up, then, ascending by a ladder to the summit, have a peep down the mouth. And were it not that the body is now completely separated from it, with a lantern we might descend into the great Kentucky mammoth cave of the stomach, but let us hold on here by this tooth and look about us where we are. What a really beautiful and chaste-looking mouth, from floor to ceiling, lined, or rather papered, with a glistening white membrane, glossy as bridal satins. But come out now and look at this portentous lower jaw, which seems like the long, narrow lid of an immense snuff-box, with the hinge at one end instead of one side, if you pry it up so as to get it overhead, and expose its rows of teeth, it seems a terrific portcullis, and such, alas, it proves to many a poor wight in the fishery, upon whom these spikes fall with impaling force. But far more terrible is it to behold, when fathoms down in the sea, you see some sulky whale floating there suspended with his prodigious jaw some fifteen feet long, hanging straight down at right angles with his body, for all the world like a ship's jib-boom. This whale is not dead, he is only dispirited, out of sorts perhaps, hypochondriac, and so supine that the hinges of his jaw have relaxed, leaving him there in that ungainly sort of plight, 
a reproach to all his tribe, who must, no doubt, imprecate lockjaws upon him. In most cases this lower jaw, being easily unhinged by a practised artist, is disengaged and hoisted on deck for the purpose of extracting the ivory teeth, and furnishing a supply of that hard white whalebone with which the fishermen fashion all sorts of curious articles, including canes, umbrella stocks, and handles to riding whips. With a long, weary hoist the jaw is dragged on board, as if it were an anchor, and when the proper time comes, some few days after the other work, Queequeg, Dagoo, and Tashtego, all being accomplished dentists, are set to drawing teeth. With a keen cutting spade, Queequeg lances the gums, then the jaw is lashed down to ring bolts, and a tackle being rigged from aloft, they drag out these teeth, as Michigan oxen drag stumps of old oaks out of wild woodlands. There are generally forty-two teeth in all, in old whales much worn down, but undecayed, nor filled after our artificial fashion. The jaw is afterwards sawn into slabs, and piled away like joists for building houses. Chapter 75 The Right Whale's Head Contrasted View Crossing the deck, let us now have a good long look at the right whale's head. As in general shape the noble sperm whale's head may be compared to a Roman war chariot, especially in front where it is so broadly rounded, so at a broad view the right whale's head bears a rather inelegant resemblance to a gigantic galliot-toed shoe. Two hundred years ago an old Dutch voyager likened its shape to that of a shoemaker's last, and in this same last or shoe that old woman of the nursery tale with her swarming brood might very comfortably be lodged, she and all her progeny. But as you come nearer to this great head, it begins to assume different aspects, according to your point of view. If you stand on its summit and look at these two F-shaped spout holes, you would take the whole head for an enormous base vial, and these spiracles the apertures in its sounding board. Then again, if you fix your eyes upon this strange, crested, comb-like incrustation on the top of the mass, this green barnacled thing which the Greenlanders call the crown, and the southern fishers the bonnet of the right whale, fixing your eyes solely on this, you would take the head for a trunk of some huge oak, with a bird's nest in its crotch. At any rate, when you watch those live crabs that nestle here on this bonnet, such an idea will be almost sure to occur to you, unless indeed your fancy has been fixed by the technical term crown also bestowed upon it, in which case you will take great interest in thinking how this mighty monster is actually a diademed king of the sea, whose green crown has been put together for him in this marvellous manner. But if this whale be a king, he is a very sulky-looking fellow to grace a diadem. Look at that hanging lower lip. What a huge sulk and pout is there! A sulk and pout by carpenter's measurement, about twenty feet long and five feet deep. A sulk and pout that will yield you some five hundred gallons of oil and more. A great pity now that this unfortunate whale should be hair-lipped. The fissure is about a foot across. Probably the mother, during an important interval, was sailing down the Peruvian coast when earthquakes caused the beach to gape. Over this lip, as over a slippery threshold, we now slide into the mouth. Upon my word, were I at Mackinaw, I should take this to be the inside of an Indian wigwam. Good Lord! Is this the road that Jonah went? The roof is about twelve feet high, and runs to a pretty sharp angle, as if there were a regular ridge-pole there, while these ribbed, arched, hairy sides present us with those wondrous, half-vertical, scimitar-shaped slats of whalebone, say three hundred on a side, which, depending from the upper part of the head or crown-bone, form those Venetian blinds which have elsewhere been cursorily mentioned. The edges of these bones are fringed with hairy fibres, through which the right whale strains the water, 
and in whose intricacies he retains the small fish when open-mouthed he goes through the seas of Brit in feeding time. In the central blinds of bone, as they stand in their natural order, there are certain curious marks, curves, hollows, and ridges, whereby some whalemen calculate the creature's age, as the age of an oak by its circular rings. Though the certainty of this criterion is far from demonstrable, yet it has the savour of analogical probability. At any rate, if we yield to it, we must grant a far greater age to the right whale than at first glance will seem reasonable. In old times there seem to have prevailed the most curious fancies concerning these blinds. One voyager in purchase calls them the wondrous whiskers inside of the whale's mouth, another hog's bristles, a third old gentleman in Hackluit uses the following elegant language, quote, There are about two hundred and fifty fins growing on each side of his upper chop, which arch over his tongue on each side of his mouth. End quote. Footnote. This reminds us that the right whale really has a sort of whisker, or rather a mustache, consisting of a few scattered white hairs on the upper part of the outer end of the lower jaw. Sometimes these tufts impart a rather brigandish expression to his otherwise solemn countenance. End of footnote. As everyone knows, these same hogs' bristles, fins, whiskers, blinds, or whatever you please, furnish to the ladies their busks and other stiffening contrivances. But in this particular the demand has long been on the decline. It was in Queen Anne's time that the bone was in its glory, the farthingale being then all the fashion. And as those ancient dams moved about gaily, though in the jaws of the whale, as you may say, even so, in a shower, with like thoughtlessness, do we nowadays fly under the same jaws for protection, the umbrella being a tent spread over the same bone. But now forget all about blinds and whiskers for a moment, and standing in the right whale's mouth, look around you afresh. Seeing all these colonnades of bone so methodically ranged about, would you not think you were inside of the great Harlem organ, and gazing upon its thousand pipes? For a carpet to the organ we have a rug of the softest turkey, the tongue, which is glued, as it were, to the floor of the mouth. It is very fat and tender, and apt to tear in pieces in hoisting it on deck. This particular tongue now before us, at a passing glance I should say it was a six-barreler, that is, it will yield you about that amount of oil. Ere this, you must have plainly seen the truth of what I started with, that the sperm whale and the right whale have almost entirely different heads. To sum up, then, in the right whales there is no great well of sperm, no ivory teeth at all, no long, slender mandible of a lower jaw like the sperm whales nor in the sperm whale are there any of those blinds of bone, no huge lower lip, and scarcely anything of a tongue. Again, the right whale has two external spout holes, the sperm whale only one. Look your last now on these venerable hooded heads, while they yet lie together, for one will soon sink unrecorded in the sea, and the other will not be very long in following. Can you catch the expression of the sperm whales there? It is the same he died with, only some of the longer wrinkles in the forehead now seem faded away. I think his broad brow to be full of a prairie-like placidity, born of a speculative indifference as to death. But mark the other head's expression. See that amazing lower lip pressed by accident against the vessel's side, so as firmly to embrace the jaw. Does not this whole head seem to speak of an enormous practical resolution in facing death? This right whale I take to have been a stoic. The sperm whale, a Platonian, who might have taken up Spinoza in his latter years. Chapter 76 The Battering Ram Ere quitting for the nonce the sperm whale's head, I would have you, as a sensible physiologist simply, 
particularly remark its front aspect, in all its compacted collectedness. I would have you investigate it now with the sole view of forming to yourself some unexaggerated, intelligent estimate of whatever battering ram power may be lodged there. Here is a vital point, for you must either satisfactorily settle this matter with yourself, or forever remain an infidel as to one of the most appalling, but not the less true events, perhaps anywhere to be found in all recorded history. You observe that in the ordinary swimming position of the sperm whale, the front of his head presents an almost wholly vertical plane to the water. You observe that the lower part of that front slopes considerably backwards, so as to furnish more of a retreat for the long socket which receives the boom-like lower jaw. You observe that the mouth is entirely under the head, much in the same way indeed as though your own mouth were entirely under your chin. Moreover, you observe that the whale has no external nose, and that what nose he has, his spout-hole, is on the top of his head. You observe that his eyes and ears are at the sides of his head, nearly one-third of his entire length from the front. Wherefore, you must now have perceived that the front of the sperm whale's head is a dead blind wall, without a single organ or tender prominence of any sort whatsoever. Furthermore, you are now to consider that only in the extreme lower backward-sloping part of the front of the head is there the slightest vestige of bone. And not till you get near twenty feet from the forehead do you come to the full cranial development. So that this whole enormous boneless mass is as one wad, Finally, though, as will soon be revealed, its contents partly comprise the most delicate oil, yet you are now to be apprised of the nature of the substance which so impregnably invests all that apparent effeminacy. In some previous place I have described to you how the blubber wraps the body of the whale, as the rind wraps an orange, just so with the head, but with this difference, about the head this envelope, though not so thick, is of a boneless toughness, inestimable by any man who has not handled it. The severest pointed harpoon, the sharpest lance darted by the strongest human arm, impotently rebounds from it. It is as though the forehead of the sperm whale were paved with horses' hoofs. I do not think that any sensation lurks in it. Bethink yourself also of another thing. When two large, loaded Indiamen chance to crowd and crush towards each other in the docks, what do the sailors do? They do not suspend between them, at the point of coming contact, any merely hard substance like iron or wood. No, they hold there a large round wad of tow and cork, enveloped in the thickest and toughest of ox-hide. That, bravely and uninjured, takes the jam which would have snapped all their oaken handspikes and iron crowbars. By itself, this sufficiently illustrates the obvious fact I drive at. But supplementary to this, it has hypothetically occurred to me that as ordinary fish possess what is called a swimming bladder in them, capable at will of distension or contraction, and as the sperm whale, as far as I know, has no such provision in him, Considering, too, the otherwise inexplicable manner in which he now depresses his head altogether beneath the surface, and anon swims with it high elevated out of the water, considering the unobstructed elasticity of its envelope, considering the unique interior of his head, it has hypothetically occurred to me, I say, that those mystical lung-celled honeycombs there may possibly have some hitherto unknown and unsuspected connection with the outer air, so as to be susceptible to atmospheric distension and contraction. If this be so, fancy the irresistibleness of that might to which the most impalpable and destructive of all elements contributes. Now, Mark, unerringly impelling this dead, impregnable, uninjurable wall, and this most buoyant thing within, there swims behind it all a mass of tremendous life, only to be adequately estimated as piled wood is, by the cord, and all obedient to one volition as the smallest insect. 
so that when I shall hereafter detail to you all the specialties and concentrations of potency everywhere lurking in this expansive monster, when I shall show you some of his more inconsiderable braining feats, I trust you will have renounced all ignorant incredulity, and be ready to abide by this, that though the sperm-whale stove a passage through the isthmus of Darien, and mixed the Atlantic with the Pacific, you would not elevate one hair of your eyebrow. For unless you own the whale, you are but a provincial and sentimentalist in truth. But clear truth is a thing for salamander giants only to encounter. How small the chances for the provincials, then! What befell the weakling youth, lifting the dread goddess's veil at Lais? Chapter 77 THE GREAT HEIDELBERG TUN Now comes the bailing of the case, but to comprehend it aright, you must know something of the curious internal structure of the thing operated upon. Regarding the sperm whale's head as a solid oblong, you may, on an inclined plane, sideways divide it into two coins, whereof the lower is the bony structure forming the cranium and jaws, and the upper an unctuous mass wholly free from bones, its broad forward end forming the expanded vertical apparent forehead of the whale. At the middle of the forehead, horizontally subdivide this upper coin, and then you have two almost equal parts, which before were naturally divided by an internal wall of a thick tendinous substance. Footnote. Coin is not a Euclidean term, it belongs to the pure nautical mathematics. I know not that it has been defined before. A coin is a solid which differs from a wedge in having its sharp end formed by the steep inclination of one side instead of the mutual tapering of both sides. End of footnote. The lower subdivided part, called the junk, is one immense honeycomb of oil, formed by the crossing and recrossing into ten thousand infiltrated cells of tough elastic white fibers throughout its whole extent. The upper part, known as the case, may be regarded as the great Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale. And as that famous great tierce is mystically carved in front, so the whale's vast, pleated forehead forms innumerable strange devices for the emblematical adornment of his wondrous ton. Moreover, as that of Heidelberg was always replenished with the most excellent of wines from the Rhenish valleys, so the ton of the whale contains by far the most precious of all his oily vintages, namely the highly prized spermaceti, in its absolutely pure, limpid, and odoriferous state nor is this precious substance found unalloyed in any other part of the creature. Though in life it remains perfectly fluid, yet upon exposure to the air after death, it soon begins to concrete, sending forth beautiful crystalline shoots, as when the first thin, delicate ice is just forming in water. A large whale's case generally yields about five hundred gallons of sperm, though, from unavoidable circumstances, considerable of it is spilled, leaks and dribbles away, or is otherwise irrevocably lost in the ticklish business of securing what you can. I know not with what fine and costly material the Heidelberg ton was coated within, but in superlative richness that coating could not possibly have compared with the silken pearl-colored membrane, like the lining of a fine pelisse, forming the inner surface of the sperm whale's case. It will have been seen that the Heidelberg ton of the sperm whale embraces the entire length of the entire top of the head, and since, as has been elsewhere set forth, the head embraces one-third of the whole length of the creature, then setting that length down at eighty feet for a good-sized whale, you have more than twenty-six feet for the depth of the ton, when it is lengthwise hoisted up and down against the ship's side. As in decapitating the whale, the operator's instrument is brought close to the spot where an entrance is subsequently forced into the spermaceti magazine. He has, therefore, to be uncommonly heedful, lest a careless, untimely stroke should invade the sanctuary, 
and wastingly let out its invaluable contents. It is this decapitated end of the head, also, which is at last elevated out of the water, and retained in that position by the enormous cutting tackles, whose hempen combinations on one side make quite a wilderness of ropes in that quarter. Thus much being said, attend now, I pray you, to that marvellous and, in this particular instance, almost fatal operation, whereby the sperm whale's great Heidelberg ton is tapped. End of chapters 74 to 77